Well, I want to thank everybody for joining me today. My name is uh, Brad Thomas Parsons, BTP. I'm a 10-speed press author and a writer here that lives in Brooklyn, New York. I've written uh, four books with 10-speed press and I have a fifth I'm working on now that I might talk about a little bit at the end if I can. Um, my first book from 2011 was Bitters and remember these will be backwards because we're in selfie mode. Um, book two, Amaro, which we're gonna have a little uh, dip our toes in the water of that in a bit. A little uh, passion project called Distillery Cats, about the hardworking cats uh, working at breweries and distilleries around the U.S. And I encourage you, if you don't already, give Distillery Cats Instagram a follow. And also, full disclosure, there is a cat walking around the floor here, so hopefully there won't be an incident. And then. My last book, which came out in October, is called Last Call. Um, and this, you know, we have exciting news to share. For those of you who don't know, um, this Monday, uh, there, there was uh, James Beard Award announcements, or nominations, and uh, Last Call was among those. It was on the uh, list for uh, beverage with recipes. And that category of three books was a 10-speed press suite. We had myself, my friend and colleague Robert Simonson for the Martini book, and Leo Robeshek for the Nomad Cocktail book. So, so I'm very excited about that. And if you haven't picked it up, you know all of these books are available online or curbside pickup from your favorite local bookstore. Um, and also, it was also nominated for a Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Award as well. So, congratulations to all those fellow nominees. For those of you all joining me now, um, in Robert Simonson, who was a couple weeks ago, and John Bonnet, who was last Thursday. They had people to help them with their camera work. I just have my cat Lewis walking around, so even with glasses, I can't really read the comments, so my apologies for that. But I will, uh, if you have any questions, you can leave them on the Instagram post on the 10 Speed page, and I'll, I'll dip in there and uh, answer them. But if there's any excitement going, I'll dip in, I'll pull a David Lee once in a while, look really close, but I'm having a hard time doing that. So, so last call, just to talk a little bit about that, since it's, it's timely as ever right now, you know, this, this book really came about as those two words, last call, because they're put together with so much weight and uh, a sense of finality, but they're also open to interpretation. Is it the end of the night? Is it the end of a bar shift? Is it good? Is it bad? And I wrote those in an email draft folder, and I was having a drink with my publisher. It just, set, you normally you'll talk about an idea when it isn't quite baked ready, and, and he really liked it. And so we sketched out the napkin, how the book might look, and we use the through line as chefs are often asked what their last meal would be. It's a little bit of a parlor game. And so I posed that question to uh, bartenders all around America, a diverse range, um, young and old from 23 to uh, 70 plus, I believe. And, and so we find out what their you know, deathbed drink would be, their death row drink. And that's just part of the story. Through that too, we see all these great um, late night traditions and rituals at these bars that often uh, most customers aren't privy to because they're long gone by then. You know, bartenders are working till two, three, four in the morning, depending what city you're in. And um, I went on the road with Ed Anderson uh, from Petaluma, California, amazing photographer. Give him a follow, Ed and Camera. Um, I hope he's watching now. Hey, Ed. And uh, Ed is, I've collaborated with Ed on all my books except Distillery Cats. He, he's, he, uh, he didn't photograph that. And he and I went on the road. Um, for a good chunk of 2018, and we went to over 80 bars, 23 cities, 13 states, um, and a lot of late nights, too many Airbnbs, rental cars, all sorts of, uh, Ed and I got to know each other. I thought I knew Ed pretty well, but we really got to know each other. And uh, it was fun, but it was a lot of work. And um, we went to, as I said, you know, dive bars, um, famous cocktail bars, high-end fine dining restaurant bars to, uh, neighborhood corner bars to like places like a hundred year old classic like Musso and Frank in Los Angeles. And um, I will just uh, give you a little glimpse into like some of Ed. There's, this is Nightcap in New York City, uh, amazing bar. Um, what do we have here? Sorry. The Polizzi Social Club in Philadelphia. Hey Guido, if you're watching and so many more. There's, this is a fun one. This was a St. Leo Lounge in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, this is one of our latest nights, and, and we wound up uh, after a long night of bar hopping, 4 a.m. This is after we went to the Chevron gas station for 
chicken on a stick. We were at Faulkner's grave at 4 a.m., um, you know, just, just saying our goodbyes. This is uh, Robert's Western World, a nice gatefold there, or, or centerfold. Uh, this was a, a night in Nashville. I was at my lowest, and when this house band starts singing uh, Delta Dawn, I, I did weep a little bit. Um, it, was, it was tough. And uh, there's Chris and Anu from Rob Roy in Seattle. So, so not to make this look like picture time, I just want to show you some of the great work in it. And so there's amazing, amazing photos, um, recipes throughout, ranging from martinis and Manhattans to strawberry daiquiris to uh, all sorts of interesting things. But, but, but this book is you is taking on an extra layer of poignancy these days that every single bar in this book is now closed, and there's at least one permanently. And and I. I all these bartenders are out of work or they're doing cocktails to go and things they didn't expect to be doing and this landscape is very different right now and I, my heart does ache for everyone affected by COVID-19 but I have a soft spot for the bartenders and this book is almost like a, a time capsule now looking back at a moment that there was just you know months ago so so shout out to all the bartenders who were in last call and helping out with that um, and I wanted to now talk a little bit about my second book, Amaro. So I promised to make you a couple of drinks, and but I want to talk a little bit about Amaro. Um, I won't do the super deep, deep dive, but I'll kind of, you know, we only have, we have three hours together, I think? Oh no, 30 minutes, I'm sorry, 30 minutes together. So I'm going to do my best to get through that and make two drinks for you all. Um, essentially, you know, what is Amaro? A lot of you know what it is, but essentially it means the bitter, the Italian word for bitter. It's also this collective class of Italian-born herbal bittersweet liqueurs that were historically and traditionally used for um, digestive aids. And it was guided more by tradition than strict categorization or classification. And in Italy, they were inspired by the, the different regions throughout Italy, from the north to the south. There were southern style Amaros, they had more citrus. There was northern style Amaros that took advantage of the new spices being brought in through through Venice and the spice trade trade routes. There's coastal style amaros, and the flavors could really range from citrus to floral to woodsy um, to to brace in very bitter to vegetal, uh, all sorts of different kinds. So, and so it's a very interesting category, but it's very uh, it's a lot to take in. And so so amaro is essentially made by macerating herbs and botanicals in a neutral spirit or a wine base. Um, you know, those range from flowers to citrus peels to barks. You have bittering agents and you have flavoring agents, and combining those, the alcohol extracts the different flavors um, and brings those together. They're then, um, they're, they're macerated for a period of time, blended together, and then they are filtered. Water is added, a sweetener, and they're traditionally aged in glass now or stainless steel for a period of time to rest and, and, and mature and have everything come together or in, in barrels for a couple months up to up to two years. And some of those bittering agents that bring on that sense of bitterness that you taste it, are like uh, cinchona bark, gentian root, angelica, uh, licorice root. And, and the thing to remember about bitter, the amaro, is you think like, oh, bitter, I don't like bitter. You know, Americans especially were late, are late to the game to embracing bitter as a flavor. We're getting better in food. Um, you know, think of kale, dark chocolate, and hoppy IPAs and things like that, but with, but with drinks, it was really the Negroni that that helped us say, hey, this is kind of you know cosmopolitan, the Dolce Vita. It's wonderful. It's interesting. But the thing about Amaro to remember is it's bittersweet. It's the level of sweetness and bitterness. Few Amari are just knock you in the face bitter. There's a couple out there, um, but but just keep that in mind. And as humans, I guess we're all humans <laughs> except for Lewis. Uh, yeah, Lewis is in the litter box as I'm saying this right now, sorry. And reminder, um, I can't really see the comments because I'm by myself except with my cat, so I apologize. But if you have any specific questions, uh, drop those on the 10 Speed Press post about this event and I'll dip in there afterwards. I see icons floating around. There's fourth half. I saw my good friend David Leibovitz in the house, Alison Renzulli from 10 Speed. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, so anyway, so humans are, we're hardwired to think that bitter is wrong, that it inspires, it's a warning sign it's, that we ingested something toxic or and our, our body is, um, wants to expel that. And so that's sort of where, where you know, the, the digestion comes in. Um, it, can, it can get your salivary glands going or it can get your stomach going. So you think of aperitivo and digestivo and, and that relationship. 
And for centuries, medieval monks and friars in Italy would use their knowledge of botany to create these herbal elixirs um, to, to, that they would give to the local community or sell um, to help people either stimulate the appetite or aid with digestion. But then there were several anti-clericism movements throughout Italy's history that drove Amaro more to the pharmaceutical side. So again, think it was medicine. It was so up, in, up through World War II, it was pretty much sold at pharmacies. And then post-World War II, it was, it was embraced more as for pleasure, as you would say, like to drink. Um, and, and a lot of that after World War II was they'd gone through a severe period of austerity and now there's a little bit of abundance. They were eating better, they were eating more, and they kind of reached to the Amari. Um, so, one, so I have a lot of bottles here I'm going to hold up in a moment to show you some different ones. But the one thing about the categorization of Amaro is it's very tricky. It's like a, it's a weird taxonomy because like Italy has so many rules about their, their prosciutto and their mozzarella and wine. But with Amaro, it, it, there are different regions, but there isn't something that says, you know, they say most Italians believe it has to be made in Italy be called Amaro. They will argue that, but um, that cat's out of the bag, as they say. But um, it, it, it really is this broad, loosely defined category. So, so with that, I will talk about some categories you can consider when you're either looking at the liquor store uh, for some curbside bottle service to, to pick up some bottles, or the next time you're at a bar or perusing a list. The first category I call is aperitivo bitters or red bitters. Um, that's our friend, you know, Campari. Uh, first thing Italian would say is aperitivo is not amaro because to Italians, amaro is about the act of when you drink it, that after the meal. Um, aperitivo, you drink it before. Um, this opens the appetite. Uh, all rules are out of the bag, pretty much. And I, I knew I couldn't write a book on amaro without having you know, Campari prominently featured. So, so, so yeah, another thing too about aperitivo, it's a lot of the same ingredients, but it's, it's just when you're consuming it. They traditionally have that red color, you just saw that, that scarlet hue. Um, sometimes artificial, historically, it was often with uh, cochineal, which was an organic dye derived from a beetle-like bug that was crushed down. And you usually don't drink aperitivo on its own, like neat or even on the rocks. If you're a Steve Zuzu fan from Life Aquatic, Campari rocks is his drink, but most people have to cut it with a little soda or seltzer or wine. Um, there are, I'm going to make a drink using a red bitter in a bit, but there are some, because we're in Brooklyn, or I'm in Brooklyn, uh, I want to call it some homemade, uh, homegrown Amaro. There's St. Agrestis' Inferno Bitter. Look at that cool bottle. Comes with a little little button up here um, you can take when you're done. Um, so we're so the, the red bitter category is pretty exciting right now with, with locally, or domestically made stuff. A brand new one, about a few weeks old, Faccia Bruto from Patrick Miller, a former chef right here in Brooklyn. And they all have different styles. Some would be more bitter, more herbaceous. Campari really hits you with the bitterness and the, it's very bold. And, and then this one we're gonna make red by Fourth Ave Spirits, their great aperitivo. We're gonna use this in a drink in a bit, so I'll talk a little bit more. Um, then you have your Gateway Amaro. Um, these are the lighter to medium style, uh, you know, that, that you can, I also call these like Goldilocks Amaro, you know, not too bitter, not too sweet, just right. These are amazing neat. Great chilled, great on the rocks, wonderful with tonic, play well in cocktails especially. They, you can almost treat them like you would have vermouth. They bring some herbaceousness, some sweetness, but also a little bitterness. So some, some to consider, you know, Amaro Lucano from Basilicata. Um, this, uh, the original creator was a, uh, a baker. So there's a lot of like, he used those kind of mentality to make this originally. And there is a bit of gingerbread, licorice hints to it. Um, a little, little fruitiness, really nice. I need my assistant. Uh, Amaro Nonino um, from Friuli. The House of Nonino are world renowned as grappa makers and this is their only Amaro. They originally just launched an aperitivo. This has a lot of nice orange notes, uh, caramelized tamarind. Um, it's a, it can be a little sweet sometimes to some, but it, it, it's a little higher proof too. It's in the 30s, so it has a nice heat to it. There's a cocktail called the Paper Plain that it's famous for. I love this on the rocks with the orange peel. I'm very happy. Um, we're going to use, oh, here's one, Ramazzotti. Uh, this one is fun. This has that cola-like notes to it, almost like a, a flat glass of root beer you left out overnight, which I know doesn't sound intriguing, but it really is. So it's got these herbaceousness, cola-like notes, really delicious. Love that one. 
and Averna, which we're going to make a drink with at the end. Um, this is uh, the classic Sicilian, there go my notes, the classic Sicilian style Amaro um, that is made in Sicily and it has probably Mediterranean herbs, pomegranate, lemon peel, orange, really lovely. Um, and before I move to the next category, we have, hold on, give me one second, folks. I have to get something here. Louis, Louis, what'd you do? Talk amongst yourselves. And we're back. All right, sorry about that. So next up is Carciofo, um, Chinar. We're gonna use this in a drink in a moment. Is everybody still there? Did I lose everyone? Sorry about that. Um, I had a fan on it, it blew my notes, then Lewis made a scene. Um, Chinar is, is uh, made with artichokes. You'll see this big old artichoke on the label. What Chinar especially, I'll talk about in a minute, but it's low ABV, so it's really dynamic. You can use it in an aperitivo um, or in a cocktail or with soda. Um, then we have, bring up our friends, Rababaro. So Rababaro is an Amaro category that is made with rhubarb root. So Zuka is a very popular, well-known one. And, and rhubarb root is naturally smoky and has a bitterness to it. There's one has been on the market for a few years from Capaletti called the Maro Sfumato. Do we have some Maro Sfumato fans out there? Um, so this is extremely smoky. It's all natural smoke. It's not like they put over wood chips. It's like a campfire, uh, reminiscent of mezcal or a peated scotch. Highly recommend this one on its own or in drinks that, that would work with those. And then we have uh, the, the Alpine style. Uh, Braulio is sort of the category killer in this one. So these are usually made in the mountain ranges or around the mountains of Italy, the, the Dolomites, the Alps. And these were uh, used high altitude herbs like juniper and wormwood and yarrow. And they have that classic, if you look at the label, those, that mountainscape there, um, it has an après ski feel to it where it really, uh, it's warming spices because you were drinking this in a colder climate. This is one of my favorite, it's hard, I don't, I won't name my favorite tomorrow if you're asking that, but it's uh, this category, the Alpine one is what I've been drawn to the last couple of years because there's more releases in it. Um, and there's some Amari that sort of cross over, like Amaro Pasubio is Alpine style. Again, you'll see those mountains. But this is also a Vino Amaro. It's made with uh, oxidized wine and it has mountain blueberries in it. So it's got this juicy, fun little jammy quality to it. This interesting. And then there's some outliers that you kind of hard to categorize, like um, Amaro del Barista. I love this. Like, look at that cool bottle. It's like a beer bottle or some homemade homemade hooch you'd have in your basement. And I love the label, it has little context clues. You see the bees and the gentian flowers. They're giving you um, clues that, you know, this is this has a natural local honey in it, raw honey. Um, it's bitter, it's smoky, has a dry sandalwood quality to it. This has become a very popular one with bartenders. If you go to a bar and order this, they kind of know what you're up to. Again, sorry I can't see all these comments, folks. I'm definitely going to, um, follow up on this if I can with any questions. And then last but not least, oh, I forgot to give a shout out with a gateway to Amaro Maletti um, in Ascoli Pacino. This has saffron and violet flower, really lovely. And bartenders love this because the price point is less than $20. They, and uh, so they can use a lot of it in their drinks. Okay, Fernet. Fernet Branca. You know it, you love it, you've seen it. Maybe you don't love it. It is strong and methylated. Um, people treat this like, you know, Fernet Branca is like Kleenex or, or Coca-Cola, where they think this is the only one. This is what Fernet is. Branca is the surname, Fernet's the category. Um, Fernet essentially has uh, a handful of, it's usually, again, there's no rules, but it's, it's uh, elevated in alcohol content. It's usually 39 or 40% alcohol, ABV. And it also has a, uh, common ingredients. There, there's peppermint, uh, saffron, myrrh, uh, aloferox, which is very bitter, bitter um, crystallized ju juice of, of the aloe plant. Um, and uh, 
and, and, and it's very, so it can be, like this is very mentholated, like candy cane like, people love it as shots. It can be a little aggressive in a cocktail, but other Fernet can be like, if you taste them side by side, or like, or like cocoa or, or coffee, there's a lot of different things to try. Here's one made in Brooklyn by Arcane Spirits. I'm just keeping all the domestic ones to Brooklyn today, so um, all love to all domestic makers, but because we're here in the 718, I wanted to give this some love. This is interesting because it's, this is very minty, but they vacuum distill, and, um, and the, the, the man that made this made this on a dare to try to replicate Fernet Branca, and he came up with his own wonderful version. All right, so in terms of how to taste tomorrow or how to drink it, you know, there's no rules. It's when I've been in Italy, it's, pardon me, when I've been in Italy, it'll be served neat, warm in a small glass, in, in like a little wine glass, sometimes with an ice cube. And the same thing is in the States. You know, there is no right or wrong. It's however you like it. And I, I personally, I like this kind of glass, like a, I think it's Duralex, like a bistro glass. Um, I like the more viscous ones, like a Verna chilled, or even with a rock or Lucano with an orange zest in it. Splash of soda, perfect. Um, David Leibovitz gifted me with a set of these little mini Duralex that are I kind of use as well if you're doing flights and you want to set out like three to try. Um, flights are a great way to try tomorrow at home. So you could try like three Fernet side by side or go light, medium, bitter, wild card. Try different things. Um, so it's very interesting. And, and, and But the thing too is like cocktails is what has gotten people really excited about uh, Amaro. So um, bartenders, you know, unlike, you know, there's a Peritivo culture where there's Negronis, Americano, spritzes, that kind of uh, al fresco, the Dolce Vita lifestyle thing. Those red drinks have been around a long, long time, but cocktails um, haven't really utilized Amaro a lot um, in historically. There's the Hanky Panky in the Toronto, but they have just a tiny bit of Fernet in them. So it wasn't until like the mid 2000s where bartenders start playing around with these, these drinks like the, the Paper Plane, the Little Italy, um, the Bitter Giuseppe. A lot of interesting drinks came out of that. So working on Amaro, it was great to have access to a lot of these creators. And when I wrote Amaro, you know, Ed and I traveled across Italy and most producers were really curious, like, why are you here? You know, what, what no one cares about this. And, and it turns out they did, which was pretty cool. Um, so I think it's time to uh, make a drink. I know I could use one. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna take you the spectrum of aperitivo to a more spirit forwarded one. Um, I don't have a, I did have these all in my refrigerator chilling, but actually my refrigerator is in the other side of the apartment. So I don't have a Collins glass, but I'm gonna use another version of this Duralex. And this drink I'm gonna make is called uh, an Americano perfect, Perfecto. It's by Damon Bolte, who's a really good friend of mine. He is the, one of the owners of Grand Army Bar right uh, a few blocks away from where I live. Um, just celebrated their five year anniversary. Bravo to that guys. And Damon used to work at Prime Meats and uh, where I was a regular for years. So I love Damon. And so Americano is, you know, refreshing drink with, with uh, soda water, uh, a red bitter, usually Campari and vermouth. Um, called the Americano because most Italians were drinking Campari soda. When Americans would visit, they, they needed that, that, uh, that, to make it a little sweeter and not as bitter. So, so with Damon's version, he's sort of combining a spritz Americano um, with a shandy. So we're introducing beer um, for the bubbles of the carbonation and a little bit of maltiness. So you're just gonna take a Collins glass or any kind of vessel you can get. There's Mary, hey Mary Kate. I'm, trying to, I'm really sorry I can't see these, I need my, Mary Kate, I asked Mary Kate, Robert Simonson's wife and a dear friend of mine, to maybe stand on my fire escape and work the camera and she didn't feel safe. I mean, I understand, we still have to be safe distance, but uh, it would have helped me a little bit. So we're gonna use this fourth half. Um, fourth half is that like, it's Campari, it's, it's red bitter, so in the Campari kind of family, but this is, uh, has, has a, a different kind of botanicals in it. It's, you got the bitterness and it's really lovely on its own. It just kind of comes in, comes at you, uh, really well balanced. I have a little, uh, not eucalyptus, um, there's rose, grapefruit, orange, all these great notes in there. So we're gonna put an ounce and a half of red bitter from 4th Ave, 4th Ave, in there. 
and then and then Damon does what a lot of bartenders do in this, where he splits the vermouth base, um, you know, because vermouths all have different styles and different, you know, main flavor profiles, so you can kind of do the best of both and bring them together. We're going to use Dolan um, from France, which this is a little lighter and drier, um, a little bit more fruit to it. We're going to put three quarters of an ounce to this, and I've got these mini bottles in because you, that way you. They don't oxidize and always keep your vermouth in the fridge. I think if you don't already know that, please, please do. So we got the three quarters ounce of Dolan. And then we're gonna round that out with three quarters ounce of Camparo, I'm sorry, uh, Antica formula, Carpano Antica. So this is a bartender favorite as well. Again, I got the mini size. This is a lot bolder and hits you with that cocoa, orange, vanilla notes. So it can be very, very strong, um, but it's lovely. So three quarters down to that. And then, so Damon's original recipe called for a Pilsner, and he usually used Einbacher. Um, I only had lager in the house. I had Peroni, which is my house beer, but I thought I'd dust off, uh, not dust off, but take out one of these champagne of beers from Miller High Life um, to kind of as a nod to uh, putting some Prosecco or some bubbles in there from the big old bottle here. So these only come out around Christmas and I, I had a few sticking around. So he calls for four ounces of this so you can you can measure or you can just you know top off with some beer there and then give it a little stir and then we're going to garnish with an orange wheel So this is the Americano Perfecto. It's a lovely little reddish amber, orange action going on there. Let's see how it tastes, with, with Miller Highlight. Oh, it's lovely. Cheers, Lewis. Has anyone ever, uh, so Damon has this, uh, you can always ask for this off menu. Um, has anyone ever had one of these with the, with the beer, Americano? They're lovely. All right. So. Another uh, quick side note on Amaro, I, I wrote a story for Punch about this, um, I call suitcase bottles. Like when you're traveling, the bottles you wanna bring back that you can't get in the US. That's been a fun hobby of mine. And so just a few to show you. This is Braulio Reserva, which is one of my favorite ones to pick up. It's um, a smaller batch version of Braulio that they age in smaller barrels. It's a little more herbaceous and they have the vintage on them. This is from 2011. So some people will collect these like verticals like they would chartreuse throughout the years. Really always like to get that one. This one, uh, San Simone, you can pretty much only get this around Torino. It's, it's a hyper local Amaro. I just look at it, I love that label. It's got this kind of Alfred Hitchcock letter vibe to it, a movie poster vibe. Um, I regretted not buying this when I was in Torino uh, for the first time and a friend of mine ended up gifting this to me. So love this one. And then sometimes if you're traveling, just pick it up if you got a cool label. Like this is a vintage one. Like I love this one, Gentleman Heaven. It's very Robert Simonson, kind of there. All right, I know I'm gonna run over time, so I don't wanna do that. Next drink I'm gonna make for you. So now we had an aperitivo, like a lighter side one, very easy to make. And now we're gonna like, the man, you know, you think of like drink templates, it's old fashioned Manhattan Negroni. Manhattan is especially one that, that's friendly with Amaro. So you have, you know, the, the black Manhattan, the little Italy, ones that where they'll introduce the Amaro kind of subbing it as the vermouth. So this is one called Yesterday, Today, and Amaro. Um, I thought the name was very fitting these days where we don't really know what day it is anymore or what month and, and don't really know what's going on. So um, this was a drink from Philadelphia bartender uh, Brian Kane. He works at a Fisher, one of Mike Salomonov's restaurants in Philly, and they were known for, still are, for these large format family style smoked uh, beef ribs, Montreal style beef ribs. And uh, so Amaro played into their menu to, to cut through all this rich food they had, which was which was a, a good call. And so when I was on my book tour for Amaro, the A Fisher event was the, the last event on the book tour. And we did, I think we did a, I want to say it was a 12 or 13 Amari tasting, which is probably not, that's pretty ambitious. 
but the restaurant sent out tons of food for everybody as well as cocktails and and normally you know you're sipping tomorrow you might use a spit glass or this this crew did not and and i don't encourage overindulgence of course but by by the sixth when we hit a morrow number six or seven i lost complete control of the room and i don't know if anyone is on the on the hey talia is on the program right now watching that went to that event i know some people were commenting on instagram i know david was there and some friends of my friends mike and ali came out peter cohen and um i was sober as a judge doing this class and i could hear like glasses breaking um you know, I just lost them. And then so we finished it and I had to sign books and the line was really long, you know, thank goodness. But um, there was a couple making out at one point. So, so I, I finally remember the end of that event, but I associate that drink with this. So we're gonna make a nice little Manhattan variation um, called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. So we're gonna take two ounces of 101 proof wild turkey, rye, sorry, the rye. So this is add a little bit of spiciness to it and the heat kicking in so with that and then we were talking about um chinar earlier so this so chinar you know you don't really taste artichoke there's a slight vegetal quality but this is not an amaro it's a sweet herbal liqueur with kind of a honey notes to it, a little bit of angelica and lemon we're going to put a quarter ounce of that in there so so these three combined those two amari and and uh the benedictine so, so the, the, the three, the, the two Amari and the herbal liqueur combined are an, almost a nod to like creating your own vermouth. So Brian, the creator, says it harkens back to uh, uh, an old style vermouth. And the name too, you know, while I'd use the name, it being fitting for our current situation of not knowing what day of the week it is anymore, Brian named that drink yesterday, today, and tomorrow is a nod to all of the uh, producers who passed down these secret recipes from generation to generation. Hey, my sister. Hey, Vicki. How are you? Okay. So you get your chilled coop or pretend it's chilled. And then I've noticed this one's popping up a bit on Instagram, I think because of the name. And then, uh, the, and, and then we're going to take a little express and discard action on this lemon. So this is the yesterday, today, tomorrow, and tomorrow. A nice kind of spirited, nightcappy style tomorrow drink. Oh, it's really lovely. I'd say for myself. Again, Brian Kane from Abe Fisher and Ben one, and Damon Bolte. The Americano Perfecto. Um, again, I wish I had was able to read these comments to keep up with you all. Let me just make sure. I just wanted to, um, you know, the thing about cocktails is it's like they're like if they're like a Trojan horse to get people excited about tomorrow. You know, you might not you know what a Manhattan looks like, you know what it feels like, what it's supposed to taste like, and then when you try, it's a little different. But the familiar the familiarity of the glass, the color lures you in. And then hopefully you'll be inspired like, hey, what was in that? A burno, let me try that. And I think a big thing with people trying to learn more about tomorrow is, you know, uh, in like training I do with restaurants and bars, is like show them the bottle, drop the bottle, leave it, let them know like, oh, the one with the choke, uh, the one with the woman picking herbs, that's Lucano. Um, and flights are a great way to do that when you leave those bottles. And at home, one little trick I learned from a great bar in Boston for a flight, and try the same Amaro, like take Braulio and serve it three ways, serve it neat, serve it on the rocks and then shake it with a little bit of citrus either lime or lemon and just serve those in three short glasses side by side um so yeah i want to thank you all i went a little over time but i want to thank you all for your patience and for joining in i hope this was a fun for everybody and if you want to uh see more tomorrow action in just a few minutes at five o'clock i'll be over on punch's uh instagram live i've been guest hosting their tip your bartender all week which is a great initiative to help support bartenders during this time. And my good friend Dan Ziders from Luca in Lancaster, Pennsylvania will be um, the bartender that I'll be talking to in less than 20 minutes. So uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you, Tensmead Press, for this opportunity. Everyone be safe, stay bitter, and I hope to see you on the other side.